You're listening to Nakedly Examined Music, a podcast about songs and songwriters. My name is Mark Lintonmeyer. My guest for episode 188 is Pat Irwin. He started in the late 70s New York no wave scene with Lydia Lunch's Eight Eye Spy and then an instrumental group, The Ray Beats, playing saxophone and guitar and keyboards. He joined the B-52s as a keyboardist and extra guitarist just after the release of their huge album, 1989's Cosmic Thing. So he was playing with them when he got this commission to do his first major TV work, which is the theme to Rocco's Modern Life, featuring the B-52s you're right now hearing. And it's now moved into some other music from that show, Rocco Needs More Time. So today we're going to be talking to him mostly about his soundtrack work. Most recently, he did all the music to Dexter New Blood. So we'll hear some selections from that. Then we'll talk about an instrumental that is not from his soundtrack work in another time. He's done a few different versions of that. The one you'll hear in full is from Duets for Electric Guitar and Piano, a 2018 EP. Then we'll hear a little of the soundtrack from Bored to Death from 2011. And go back to Hoodlum Priest by the Ray Beats from... Glass, the Lost Philip Glass Sessions, 1982. And finally, we'll hear a track from an instrumental group that he's been in very recently called Sus, S-U-S-S. And we'll hear the title track to a 2022 EP called Winter Was Hard. For more information, please see patirwinmusic.com. For more about this podcast, see nakedlyexaminedmusic.com. And if you want to support the effort, go to patreon.com slash nakedlyexaminedmusic. So I played a little bit of some of the music from Rocco's Modern Life. This was your first foray into TV. Is that right? No, not really. I actually did some episodes of Tales from the Dark Side. Okay. And, uh, but it was my first full series. But you've been doing programmatic music. This was 1992. You'd been doing before. What was the transition from doing soundtrack work just for theater and things to getting on TV? Was this just who you know? How did this transition happen? For Rocco, I was in a band called the Ray Beats Mm -hmm. and we were playing this really kind of famous show on 42nd street called the Times square show, which was an art opening, but it was kind of a famous event and we were playing and it was just down the stairs from the Nickelodeon headquarters, which was just starting up. And a producer Kate was there who was a fan of the Ray Beats And he just suggested me, essentially, to do the music. Obviously, on the theme song here, we've got the B-52s singing, which you were in the back line playing with them uh, in their live shows at the time. Like, are the instrumentalists we're hearing on the Rocco stuff? Was that just the studio people that were already involved? Or or did you pull in Ray Beats members and, you know, other acquaintances? No, no. That was the Rocco's Modern Life band. The Rocco band. Okay. So, you know, we're going to be talking about uh, Dexter Newblood in a minute. and. That sounds pretty through composed. I wouldn't suppose that a cartoon would be that through composed. Like how much did you have to write versus how much was reused episode after episode? Oh, no, no, no. It was through composed. Okay. Wow. It was like being in an engine. There was so much music. You wouldn't believe it. I guess with the fast pace of cartoons, it's like more per minute than in Dexter or whatever else, at least with these Dexter songs. Some of them are a minute long, but some of them you kind of get to breathe. The series is kind of a slow burn in the first place. There's lots of gazing into the middle distance and driving cars around. So I imagine, yeah, can you say a little about are the environments for doing these various soundtracks to get us from Rocco to Dexter vastly different in terms of the expectations, the oversight? Well, the instrumentation, New Blood sounds like this is mostly you during the pandemic by yourself as opposed to like a, an ensemble. Dexter New Blood was myself during the pandemic using a combination of vintage synthesizers and some new computer technology and then a fair amount of guitar feedback. Like I would set up guitars here behind me in my studio and just turn them on and let the sound feedback. And I would capture that. Sometimes it's a little more audible than others. With Rocco's Modern Life, it was a full live band. Bass, drums, woodwind doubler, trombone, percussion. I played organ and keyboards. We had everything from violin and harmonica. Tony Trishka played banjo on one episode. Trumpet, bagpipes. I mean, is that your preference to do it old school with an actual band? Well, it actually depends. I mean, Mm -hmm. 
Um, it depends on what the show needs. Sure, I love playing in a live band. I love the feeling of moving air. But Dexter, the producers were really looking for a different sound, something much colder and ambient, austere. Let's introduce that. The main piece that we're going to play here is New Blood Suite Part 3, which is about three minutes. And then there's another minute or so, a different piece that we'll throw in somewhere in the discussion that I think is the conclusion of the whole series. So this suite, I wasn't really sure, you know, when I'm looking at your SoundCloud, they don't have all the same titles, or at least there wasn't something with this title. Clearly, you had to integrate your sound So it's Daniel Licht. Is that the previous composer who passed away in 2017? And at the very end of this, we hear that piano theme that happens every episode. I don't know, in the the original series, but this is a new location in the series. And as you said, colder, you know, that literally there's Arctic, you know, everything is in snow in the thing. So I guess that's supposed to reflect, yeah, any other sort of orienting words before we hear the, the piece. Well, the New Blood Suites on the soundtrack are the pieces that directly refer to Daniel Lick's original theme. And I just pulled together several shorter cues and turned them into suites. So that's really what you're listening here. And there's four of them on the Dexter New Blood soundtrack. All right, so it's not just the da, na, 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 that comes in at the end. It's even the da, da, the general chords. You're saying that's sort of built off of Licht's stuff. But you're mentioning the combination of the digital and the analog synthesizers that it's like we want a string pad, 
but you have several different kinds of string pads, you know, that can come in on top of each other and throb at different rates to, you know, to give us punctuation to the piece. Right. Yeah. Well, there aren't any strings. It's all synthesizers. So it's all this kind of synthetic, cold, really getting inside not only the location, which is the Arctic chill, as you mentioned, upstate New York on the snow, but um, inside of his mind. You know, it's a new character. That was the thing about adapting the older material. This is a new life for Dexter. He's no longer Dexter. He's Jim Lindsay. And we really wanted to punctuate that. Let me play a little bit. Around 29 seconds in, there's a particular very pokey, uh, shimmering glass swipe I put. Yeah, this thing that sort of sounds like a uh, Arco, some boat with a... That was an Arco sample played off the string, so it, it, it had distortion on it. Okay, so you're taking these sort of standard samples and then putting them through a lot of processing, I assume. A, a fair amount, yeah. Okay, yeah. Can you say a little about how you're creating the ensemble for this, that there's something, if you're doing something that's supposed to connote jazz or, you know, the Rocco's... There's sort of built in musical history of these sounds go together, but using pretty straight piano and make that up front and then a bunch of analog synthesizers. I'm trying to, I mean, is there, are there particular, like, uh, I really like the John Carpenter from the thing soundtrack, that kind of, do you know what you're channeling here? Yes. As a matter of fact, in the very, very beginning of the process, I believe I brought up the soundtrack to Chernobyl Mm. as well as Trent Reznor's soundtrack and Atticus Ross's soundtrack for The Social Network, more ambient. And then I love that kind of ambient music in general. I have a band called Sus Mm -hmm. that has a new record out soon that is ambient in nature. I love that music, dating back to the first Frippinino, no pussyfooting ambient recording. So there's definite precursors to the sound. Another chunk from about 56 seconds in, you have a low string pad that peaks. It gets gets very distorted here. I guess not very distorted, but if this was truly a digital thing, that would not happen. (laughs) Well, actually, that's an analog synthesizer opening up the filter. Okay. And it's just, you know, letting it kind of go out of control. Some of these older synthesizers that I have basically have their own personalities. And if I can get them right, they'll work. And that was just opening up the filter and the modulation to kind of go to a distorted place. And you caught it. That's kind of fun for me that you noticed that. Yeah. So, I mean, if this were an electronic piece, I would imagine, you know, we're starting with the rhythm bed or something. You know, you've got a length. But with this, it sounds more like you sort of were inching through it and like, oh, what's the character next? Or or did it start with the piano layer? What was the actual order of operations here? It sounds like it's, it's more of an analog creation like My Life in Bush of Ghosts rather than, you know, layering a sequence. Well, I had to find a palette of sounds that would work. Um, and it took a little bit of time. Some of the first cues that I was doing were for when Dexter's son Harrison is stalking him in the first episode. And I was using an older synthesizer. And that sound just wasn't working for the show. It was just not working. So I had to replace it with something else. But, you know, just basically, it's like putting together an ensemble, only we're using synthesizers and layers. It's like a string quartet, only instead of a cello, viola, violin, and violin one and violin two, it's like synthesizer one, synthesizer two, three, and four. And then this feedback, the guitar feedback that I mentioned. And are you doing this as I picture soundtrack people doing with sort of a time code of the edited scene in front of you? Or is it more, there's going to be the scene here, do something and we'll sort of figure out how, like, is it all completely edited before you even get near it? No, I'm working with rough cuts. Hmm. So it's a little bit of both. But that moment that you just pointed out was synchronized to something happening on the picture. So I had to work very carefully with that to make that work. That wasn't random. Yeah. So when the theme finally comes in at the end, 
I imagine that's connoted by something in the story. You know, the, the familiar thing is coming up. That's exactly how it okay. works. Find one other spot, 220, where you actually introduce some percussion here. It's when the piano thing comes in, but then it also has this click that sounds exactly like when there's a digital glitch on my podcast audio that I want to remove. But you're actually making that the snare drum, I guess. You actually are introducing a little loops or a sequence at that point. Or is the whole thing, is there actually a consistent metronome going through the whole thing? You just only hear it at this point. Well, that's actually a good point. There is a consistent metronome, but I'm not playing with it. I'm using it. There's a timeline that it comes in at that particular point, synchronized with the image and plays for a certain amount of time and then either goes off to another place or that's the end of it. So any thought about that choice of rhythm section there, that there sounds like there's sort of a low something that maybe is the kick, you know, but then there's this clicking. What made that fit in the ensemble? Is that a sample or? Yeah, I don't know that it's a sample, but it, I like eccentric percussion. Mm -hmm. I have a little bass drum over here. I probably combined that, hitting that with my hand, and that made the sound of a click. Okay. But I like the sound of synthetic percussion. If it's you recording yourself with your hand, then it's kind of not, I guess the, the line between synthetic percussion and not is not very clear at this point. If you're starting with samples. It could have either been okay. that, or uh, it could have been, you know, just something that I, I made using a percussive type sound on a mini Moog. It could be many things. Let's throw in the one other, just to get, a sense of the sampling. I mean, there are lots of tracks on the soundtrack of this, uh, many of which are very short. The letter, let's just throw it in there. So do you remember what the character, this, uh, you know, this, this hissing that sort of starts things off that introduces you? Is this a, a digital synth, I assume? or That scene was Dexter's son is reading a letter that Dexter had kept away, had written to him when he was a young boy and that Dexter's son had with him. And he's, it's the end of the whole series. It's the mm -hmm. last music in the whole series. And I just, I liked that sound of that, the noise of it. I just felt it put it in the right place. There's another trick that I, I'm not sure if it happens in, in this little bit, but you know, in addition to the different synths pulsing in and out is that some of the time they come in, I guess it does have an underlying rhythm in that it has like, it's throbbing according to a, a 16th note beat that it seems like you can sort of turn a knob as to whether or it's just a whether it's a is that just the speed of the modulation of that sound or is that tied into like the sequence you know the overall tempo of the of the tune oddly what i would do is sometimes i would just find a sound on the mini moog and play what i call an event and then i would create a loop of that and it would modulate in time and so i would use that as a metronome like the plugin that you're using for your delay or whatever is built into the sequence and sort of it knows what tempo you've set for the sequence. No, I wasn't using the plugin for delay. I was mm. creating the sound directly in the, in the synthesize and then loop that. Okay. I thought you meant loop it in the, in the software. Well, pr maybe we're saying the same thing. I would create a loop and put it in the software, but it's not a delay. Okay. 
We're going to do some more soundtrack stuff in a little bit, but I want to look at the other side of your writing. You had suggested this song, In Another Time, the version from Duets for Electric Guitar and Piano 2018. Is that right? I guess. Okay, that's what your SoundCloud seems to indicate. But clearly, this is an important piece because wandering around your SoundCloud, there's at least two other versions of this. So that you've got the new version with J. Walter Hawks on trombone from your 2019 album, Wide Open Sky. And then I heard this version from 2010. It looked like you posted. I'm not really sure. That has, it's not piano and guitar. It's guitar, This pretty much the same guitar part, but then sequence synths and... Yeah, yeah. That version with the organ that you're hearing, that's an organ I found on the street in Long Island City here. It's one of those console organs. Yeah, I think that was the first time I played that. So this piano version, though, that we're about to hear, is this what you consider the definitive version? That it's at least through composed by you, where it sounds like the version with Walter, maybe he got the jam. Yeah, Walter improvised, definitely. So this is the the full composed version here in another time. Thank you. 
any thoughts about how, I mean, it sounds like you just came up with this guitar part and it's a very nice, simple, beautiful part. And then just compose variations. It almost sounds like, you know, one of these box variations or whatever, in terms of you wrote this out. This is not you playing it. This is Brian Cavanaugh Strong. Is that right? That's correct. Brian was a student of mine. Coincidentally, has a piece up at Lincoln Center. The guitar part, incidentally, was inspired by, also by inspired by a student of mine. But yeah, the piano part is definitely through composed. And the guitar part was inspired by a student, Arby Srinivasan. Yeah, it's got this sort of a, a drone feel to it, just because you mostly have, you know, you're going back and forth between two notes. And the second one is, except for the end of the phrase, is always the same. So it anchors it that way. When you say this was inspired by your student, what does that mean? It sounds like this is just something that you stumbled on on the fretboard, but you're saying this was something that maybe was in your head before it was in your hands. Yeah, the student had submitted a demo with those combinations of notes on it, and I found that particularly inspiring. You know, like composers get inspiration from places, you know, and this is where I got mine for this. Okay, even the different versions are different lengths. And clearly you had, here is a melody, whether it's happening on the organ or the piano or the first thing you hear the trombone do. But then after that, yeah, how sort of integral are the rest of the variations in terms of like when you were with Walter that did you sort of just leave it to him after listening to your demo as to how much he was going to include of that or, you know, how long it was going to go? I mean, we were collaborating on a record. So I wrote in the score what I intended Walter to play and the inversions, and what to improvise over. He's a jazz musician and has that kind of ability. So I wrote what the parameters for improvising into the score. Using it like, okay, here's the head. Make sure to play that, and then take it from there. Obviously, it's not a traditional head (laughs) range. I mean, it's pretty catchy. I I don't know, maybe it's just the fact that I've now heard (laughs) three, four, if you count the Tiny Desk Concert live version. Wow, that's cool that you know all that. It's fun. I have to go into my SoundCloud page, man. I, I'm not up to date on it. Well, and I was wondering about so that even in the Walter version that you reintroduce the sort of spazzy little percussion that was in the original version. At least a version of that, not the same exact sounds, but like you've got these very light little hi-hat programmed percussion bits, which are not in this piano version that we just heard. I don't know. I always think of this in terms of like, what is the core of the song for you? Clearly, those percussion things were interesting enough that you brought them back for this final production, but they're not the song. Or is it just because this is supposed to be like a classical performance mode and you wouldn't have little programmed noodly percussion there? Well, I'm not exactly sure how to answer that, but I like sort of random percussion and I like electronic percussion. We were talking about it, about the Dexter score and I like vintage drum machines. And so basically the sound with Walter, I believe, is a drum machine with two or three buttons pushed at the same time with different kind of beats that are conflicting with one another. And that's the spazzy effect that you're referring to. Okay. And then, so you just sort of set during the mix, like how much of the, cause it's, it's pretty. No, we play do. Oh, okay. So, so this is a live, it's not a live to two tracks. You could always fix stuff, right? It's at least live to four or five, six tracks. We play it live together. Okay. If that's in jazz mode, I guess this is why I'm asking in terms of when you're doing a duet for electric guitar and piano, it's a project. It's not an album. Like, what is the presentation? Was this created for a particular show? Actually, I'm glad you're mentioning it because it's just something that I started to do, a project that I started that I didn't finish, which is music for electric guitar and piano. And I'd like to finish it someday, but I didn't. I stopped after a couple of things and moved on to, for all I know, it was Dexter. But I'd like to come back to it, you know, and I'm really happy and flattered that you caught it and, and listened to it because. You made me revisit it. So that's really nice. I I appreciate it. Let's stop for a brief break. Everyone has that favorite album. You know, the one. 
the one that requires the windows down and the volume up, the one that makes you dance or reflect, the perfect headphones record, your desert island disc, the one that set you on a lifelong path of being a music fan. Check out a new podcast called Music Rewind, told by fans to a fan. Each episode, they tell the stories and memories of your favorite albums. Join host Steve Epley as he sits down with guests, fans just like you, to talk about their favorite album, how they discovered it, and what makes it special to them. Music Rewind's new season is starting soon, and previous seasons are available wherever you listen to podcasts. Visit musicrewindpodcast.com to stay up to date on upcoming episodes, bonus content, and more. You may find yourself remembering your own favorite album or discover a special one that passed you by. As host Steve likes to say, listen to the full album. Let us also talk briefly about Masterclass, where an annual membership gets you access to over 150 exclusive classes taught by instructors you know and love. This is a streaming platform available on iOS, Android, Desktop, Apple TV, Fire TV, and Roku, bringing you classes taught by world-class instructors at the top of their fields, generally broken out into individual video lessons, usually around 10 minutes long. I like to just listen to them as audio, like a podcast, but they're beautifully shot. There are supplementary materials that come with most of them. There's a chance to interact with other members who are experiencing the class. It's a great lifelong learning experience. And for music in particular, there are 24 classes by big names like Usher, Danny Elfman, Hans Zimmer, Herbie Hancock, Reba McIntyre, Christina Aguilara, St. Vincent, Questlove, Nass, Metallica, John Legend, Mariah Carey, Yo-Yo Ma, Etc. The thing I was most excited about looking at today is a new series exclusive to this platform called Talking Shop, where you get to meet your hero's hero. I listened to Neil Gaiman talking about Tolkien and Cornell West on Muhammad Ali. You're just going to run across all these other little things. You're going to find some of your favorite authors, filmmakers, sports heroes, politicians. You want to learn something about a blockchain? You want to take some cooking classes? Or learn about wilderness survival or the art of negotiation. Things that you did not think that you were even looking for. You will certainly find things that you're interested in and things that pretty much any member of your family is going to be interested in that you can share this with. I highly recommend you check it out. Get unlimited access to every class. And as a nakedly examined music listener, you get 15% off an annual membership. Go to masterclass.com slash examined now. That's masterclass.com slash examined for 15% off masterclass. I assume that the soundtrack stuff is is your income. So in terms of these other things, is that just sort of when there's time, when there's inspiration, then you'll do so or or is is in the background, even if you're working on something like this, well, I could repurpose this for a soundtrack. What sort of what is your attitude in terms of your Well, the very first one that you were referring to with the organ, those were records that I made, those are little CDs that I would make and give away to friends using instruments that I would find on the street or in thrift stores or yard sales when I was on the road with the B-52s and I would buy, whether it was an auto harp or a chord where you just press a button and it plays a chord. In this case, the organ that you're referring to, I found on the street over here by the Long Island Railroad tracks. And I would just make these songs. And that's, I don't know what record it is, but I made a handful of them. And I always love them. They're called New Sounds from the Lost and Found. And these, they're just instruments that I would find, thrift store instruments and whatnot. So that's, you just are looking at that as sort of a coherent creative project where you're trying to get a label deal for that project or? No, I don't have much time for labels. I mean, I would just give it to friends, but I would make that music because at the time when I, the first one I was doing, I was writing music for this cartoon called Class of 3000. And my studio was down in the meatpacking district. And it was in the very beginning of like, instead of mailing cassette tapes and DAT tapes overnight by FedEx, you would upload files and samples, music files, MP3s. And it would take so long. And I had all this dead time. So I would make these records in my dead time, or I'd have to wait to get approval for a cue, or I'd have to wait for a final cut. That was a good project. That was a cartoon with created by Andre 3000 from the band Outcast. And he and I collaborated on that show. You got an interest, I mean, in that you have an outlet for your music that is the soundtracks that it pays and is fundamentally different than what you were witnessing with the B-52s and what you were doing earlier on with the, well, we'll get to your Ray Beats and your your other early projects, but, you know, you got to 
be witness to the aftermath of these huge B-52s albums where it's not just, we're just a band and we just do a thing and we put it out. It's like a whole, you know, with the major label and it's got a, I assume that then like when the Fred Schneider solo album after that comes out, it's not a matter of, this is just something that I did as a little project. It like, there's some expectation or at least because there's interest in a possibility of, you know, a label. So just many more hoops to jump through than, I had some extra time and I had these instruments. And so I made some records. The B-52s were definitely on another level. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was a major label rock show kind of tour. It didn't start out that way. I mean, they were on Warner Brothers, but there was no guarantees that that was going to turn into a hit when we started. Yeah, no doubt about it. That was on the B-52s were on another level altogether. The lost and found are CDs that I made myself in the computer and would maybe press up about 25 of them. And give them away. And would you ever reuse that stuff for soundtracks then if it seemed like there was something that was totally open-ended? <laughs> I think in another time I did mm -hmm. because I liked that piece. And so when it came time to like want to write something for electric guitar and piano, I thought of that piece. And so I adapted it. Well, and I, I'm hoping the Walter version is picked up for the soundtrack to something. Like it could be a, a really nice theme song for some drama of some Have you sort. seen the video of Walter and I walking around the neighborhood here in Long Island City? Maybe. I There's will. a YouTube video uh, of us starting off at sunset and we're in different locations here in the neighborhood. I love that version. And I played, it's a really nice place where I live here in Long Island City. And Walter and I would set up and play in art galleries and whatnot. You know, he's a, also a composer for film and television. And so it's always fun to play music with him when we have the time. Let's get a little more soundtrack stuff out. Moving back to uh, another big show, Bored to Death. Uh, uh, yeah. Your work in 2011 is what it was labeled on your SoundCloud. I know this, this show started a little earlier than that. Did you jump on in a later season? Is that? Yeah, I was on the third season. Yeah. Any sort of introductory words about how this environment and this task differed from, I mean, it's, it's a mystery. It's a detective show, but it's, you know, a very tongue in cheek, almost satire of detective shows. Was that sort of what the task you were given? Yeah. I mean, these guys are not your conventional detectives. Craigslist, I believe. Yeah. By the third season, things are getting a little bit more dramatic and involved and the cases are becoming a little bit more prickly and so the music is becoming a little bit more cinematic by the third season so we're going to hear a clip from that just really short one called framed Yeah, so a very kind of Danny Elfman-y feel. It's just that in that is orchestrated and sinister and has some, uh, yeah, any thoughts about that clip in particular, choosing those sounds? I love that scene. And Bored to Death was a real thrill to work on. I had a great band for that. Like, again, it was kind of closer to the Rocco's Modern Life mm -hmm. template in that I had uh, bass, drums, piano, clarinet, which you're hearing. Walter actually played on it and I played guitar. I'm trying to remember the other, the other clips, the two that we picked, you know, sound very much like we're digging around looking in files or whatever, whatever the things that they have to do in, in mystery TV shows, which there's so much of that police procedurals or whatever, you know, or the, I don't know if it's the most prevalent kind of TV show. This is, you know, over a decade ago. So maybe we, it's not as pervasive. Well, it was kind of a, a combination of the band that I had called the Ray Beats. Mm-hmm. And the cartoon is very much a, a cartoony vibe. Mm -hmm. And it's just my thing, sort of Brooklyn noir. I have heard that your vibes is a popular, you know, or some sort of 
xylophone, you know, has to go in everything that it provides. It's the, do you always use the real instrument when you do that? It's because like synth vibes, even from my crummy 1987 keyboard sound pretty damn good. Well, that's the thing. They do sound pretty damn good. But when you hear the real thing, you notice. I had just seen something with Danny Elfman that he actually like has a giant collection of marimbas and that's what he writes on, like not on piano that he writes... (laughs) I assume that that's not the that you're writing on piano or something. When you're putting one of these arrangements together, are you demoing it on piano and then getting the whole score up? Is anybody helping you get all the various parts out? Are you communicating with them more like a band? Like, do you actually hand sheet music to the drummer, for instance? Yeah, I hand sheet music to the band. I'm composing mainly on the piano to the computer and orchestrate it in the computer using samples and whatnot which are then sent to the producers for approval and the network. They have to approve every cue. Every piece of music gets approved. And then once it's approved, then I wait until the final cut, but I send it to, I either do the music copying myself. That's when I transcribe the music for the instruments so that everybody can read them. And you're actually transcribing it, not like, using the sequence and then pulling it into professional composer or whatever the program would be. And it creates the, and saying this, this should be clarinet and then it transposes it. I don't know if you know that much about it, but if you play something into the piano, Mm -hmm. it doesn't come out readable. I've always wished at least, I mean, because when I put stuff together like that, yeah, no, I thought somebody had figured out some better way of uh, doing transcriptions in a more automated way. You know, like a whole note is four beats. Sure. One, two, three, four. But it's not played as four beats. It's played as three and something. So like when you play it and then you lift off, it'll be like three beats with a bunch of 16th notes added to it or something. The computer will get more precise. So you have to tell the computer that you want it to be a whole note or a half note. And I have workarounds for that. I can, I know how to do that quickly if I'm hearing something in my mind so that I can tell the computer exactly what I mean. But it's not all that efficient. So it's probably faster just that you've got the sequence in one window and you've got your composer. I assume you're still using a computer, though, to create the notation. You're not getting staff paper out and doing... Yeah, but in the very beginning of Rocco's Modern Life, I did use staff paper. I have pictures of me, little blurry-eyed little red circles around my eyes where I'm writing all the parts out by hand. When I was in composition school was actually around that time was, you know, 1992. Uh, So that's the most technology that I'm really familiar with in terms of how people actually do this, which was we had to learn how to write on paper. You learn to write on paper too. Yeah, yeah. And for somebody with bad handwriting and just not an artistically inclined visually, that was not something I wish on people. That uh... I'm right there with you. <laughs> there are people who are really good at that. The Disney cartoon that I did, Pepper Ann, had some of the most incredible copyists I've ever worked with. A whole team who were doing, you know, those big Disney movies. And they would come to the recording sessions. And so if we needed to make a change, the copyist would go out and change the parts by hand or it was fabulous making sure that all the musicians had parts that looked clean and could be readable without making a mistake. Yeah. Were any of these sort of a big enough production? I mean, I would think HBO, one of their big shows at the time would give you some resources that you'd have a team or something, but no, it was just you. That's the way these kind of deals are structured for cable TV. But I guess having to do the full demo with the MIDI at least forces you to be very organized in a certain way that, you know, the session, I don't know, how long would the sessions run? Would you try to do like several episodes worth of stuff with the full band, like in one or two days in a session, or would this be? No, but I would try to do a whole, Board to Death was a half hour episode. So I would try to do the whole episode in a day, maybe five or six hours. And I assume when you're working with good studio people, it's sort of, as long as you've written the music correctly, <laughs> I don't know, did you run into problems where you're having to fix stuff on the fly that you're playing it? Like, that doesn't sound right. That Occasionally that happens. I like working with musicians who are my friends. That doesn't mean they're not masters and they don't want a session to be run well and for it to 
start and end when we say it's going to end. But I like to be able to look through the parts with everyone at the beginning and just make sure it looks right. And there are occasional mistakes. But even, you know, symphony orchestras do that as well. They'll read through the parts to make sure there aren't any issues with transposition or whatnot. Very different, I guess. I have stories about, like, Zappa working with the London Symphony Orchestra, and they had nothing but contempt for him. And sort of having this, putting music in front of the professional players, that you're in this New York small ensemble thing where it's it's not that. It's that you get to work with people that you're friendly with as opposed to these are the guys that are is it just that you are well connected enough. So those people that you're friendly with are also the guys that are just in there all day being served new music that they just have to sight read and it just becomes a job. Well, there isn't that kind of scene in New York anymore. That's for sure. You know, at the end of the day, it's about the hang. You know, you want to be working with people that you like. You want to hang out with people that are you like, who are bringing something to what you're doing. All the musicians that I work with make the music better. I mean, it's not like they're improvising, but they'll, with the expression, with the cartoon, we'll look at it and I'll kind of describe in the dynamics, I'll say panic or something is happening and they'll want to know what's going on. We don't have the time or the budget to record two picture. So I have to have everything scored out and it has to be there on the paper. But I like it when musicians add something just a little bit extra. And do you have a team sort of technically as well? Or are you just the, you're the engineer, you're the producer, other personalities that you've had? I'm a terrible engineer. (laughs) Okay. Especially if we're trying to record a full live band, that's hard. (laughs) Like not making sure everything is bleeding only the way you want it to bleed. So are you working with the same people all the time? Or is it just that whatever studio that you happen to book, that's your... No, no. Uh, For the most part, I've worked with the same engineer since 1992, Ah. since Rocco's Modern Life. And I've worked with him on Dexter. I talked with him this morning about something else. His name is Patrick Derevez. And I really couldn't do anything without him. He makes everything sound better. And he keeps it organized. And he has talents and skills that I do not have. A couple shows that I worked on that needed a grand piano, we would go into other studios, Studio G, and I would book that one over a year, well, 12 episodes or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. And that was the same studio. But most of the time, I work with this particular engineer, Patrick Derevaz. I want to make sure before we got out of here that we did revisit some of the old stuff since you had such an interesting prehistory. This is why some of the questions I've been asking are sort of trying to get at what music as a career is to you at this point, because, you know, you become a soundtrack guy who then apparently has the freedom and artistic license to then record stuff like the duet album and labels are not even an issue anymore. Nobody, you know, whereas at the beginning of your career, I mean, I guess you're working with Lydia Lunch, like sort of in this indie punk scene, but it's still like most people in their 20s, this is going to be the career. This is going to be the big band. The Ray Beats are going to tap into some... Can you say a little about sort of what the Ray Beats were as a unit before we hear this uh, thing from your last release, this uh, archive, the Lost Philip Glass Sessions? We knew we weren't the Beatles. Mm -hmm. We were assigned to a label called Beggar's Banquet. They were an indie... They were based in London. I don't think we had a U.S. label. The Rabies were formed out of, there was a, a record called No New York, which was produced by Brian Eno. And it had four New York bands, pretty abrasive, aggressive bands, Contortions, Teenage Jesus and the Jerks, DNA and Mars. And the Rabies were three guys from the Contortions and me. And we wanted to be an instrumental band. Everybody Really, whether it was the Ventures or the Shadows or Booker T and the MGs, we loved instrumental music. And we just wanted to have an instrumental band. And we thought, okay, well, this will be fun. We weren't really thinking about the fact that nobody was going to buy the records. It was sure was fun while it lasted. Did it seem as an instrumental thing? Like I know people in surf bands and it works really well as a live thing. Like we're going to go out and see the surf band. And this is a more artsy post-punk version of that. You know, it's the surf band thing, but it's not stuck in Dick Dale. It's, you know, this is the early 80s. Whereas my friend in the surf band, like, yes, they put out records, but that's sort of not the point. It's, you know, just hearing that kind of thing as live music. Was this band more about the live show and the touring than about the record? Or did you even think of it? We did a lot of touring. We played shows with the B-52s. 
which was fun. We played all around. We went around the block and the shows were pretty good. I mean, again, it's about the hang. Mm -hmm. and we hung out. Was there a lot of changes in different performances? Like, was there a, a lot of improvisation involved that you've got, again, sort of, this is the head of the song, and then from there, it can be different lengths, or did it just become a machine that, no, this is the set, and it's, it's going to sound pretty much exactly the same every time? Well, that's an interesting question. Yeah, there were definitely preconceived arrangements, but they weren't scored out like a soundtrack would be. That was very much just four guys getting together in a room and playing and going, how many times? Okay, we play that 12 times. Then we go to this section. That'll be the B section. You know, and there were structures. But there was a fair amount of improvisation in the Ray Beats as well. Well, we get to hear that a little on this. So you got your first EP and your first album, 1981, and then your second full album that gets released, 1983. Well, this the Lost Philip Glass Sessions is in between those in 1982. And of the tracks you sent me, a couple of them are just things that you ended up putting on It's Only a Movie, your final LP. This one that they're about to hear, Hoodlum Priest, was not on there. Any introductory words about it before we hear it? It was kind of an idea that the drummer, Don Christensen, had, who has made some really cool records under by himself under the name Implog. But Johnny and I went out to Coney Island. We wanted to get the sound of the people screaming on the roller coaster out there and work it into the record, but it didn't work. So we ended up recording the sound of a thunderstorm on the street and working that into the sound of the record. And the gist of the idea was an idea of, from Don. And then we just built it up from there.
was the legendary Philip Glass playing keyboards on what? How did this these sessions even come about? On this particular one, uh-huh. Phil is not. But oh, on he's every, not. All right. On every other one, he is. Well, I picked the one. <laughs> That's fine. I like the. I guess the the storm sound provides the ambiance that on some of the other ones. I don't know, like the uh, Jack the Ripper. So that's the opening track to It's Only a Movie. And then there's also a version on the Philip Glass ones. I don't think it's aided by that the keyboard that he was putting on. Like, I really like It's Only a Movie version. So I don't know. <laughs> it seems. Oh, there you go. You know, at least this was a, a unique thing. I don't know. What was with the timing that this session's coming out on 2013? Well, we made, we made like four or five tunes and the record company that we were working with didn't want them. Okay. They said, no, we don't like it. And so we just forgot about it and put it into the closet. And I would run into Philip over the years. And we would all say, you know, that stuff was good. We should put that out. Yeah, we should put that out. We never did. And then all of a sudden, 20 or 30 years go by. And it was like, Philip had his own label, Orange Mountain. And he said, okay, I can put it out on my label now. And that's what we did. All right. Well, I will link to the stuff actually featuring Philip Glass. <laughs> if folks want to hear that, but I more just wanted to get a handle on what the Ray Beats were about and how that relates to your, you keep mentioning that the writing as a, the Ray Beats wrote as a group. So, so it's not, even though it's a similar feel. And in fact, one of the songs you, you sent to me was a sort of detective sounding thing, just like what we just heard in Bored to Death. The music from Bored to Death was definitely inspired by the Ray Beats. So how would that work? You know, the, the Ray Beats in terms of writing instrumental, would you come in with a chord progression or somebody, somebody would come in with a basic riff and, and you would just jam until it's a song? Do you recall how the... Yeah, basically. Okay. I don't like the way rock bands do things. Sure, but I think lyrically and also, you know, again, sort of who gets writing credit, even if it's a very collaborative rock band, unless you have some sort of pre-arrangement that people are going to get paid for arrangements, then it's like, well, somebody comes in with the chord progression and the words, and that's the song. The song is, even though it's just a life, a shell of of what it's going to be when the whole band plays it. Whereas in an instrumental thing, I don't know, unless there's something comparable that you sort of had a chord progression and the lead riff in mind, and like, that's the thing you would introduce. Well, we shared everything. Mm -hmm. So you just legally said, it doesn't matter. Maybe this song, in fact, is entirely Pat written, but we're just going to... Everything's credited to everybody because that's just the way. Yeah, basically credit everybody. But there wasn't a lot of legal. Uh, <laughs> well, there's no money to split. It doesn't really matter, <laughs> I guess. Yes, a democratic beginning makes things easier. Well, so I wanted to get that out there. Uh, we're going to close by leaving folks with a short tune from your current group project, Sus, that you mentioned. Winter Was Hard was the track you mentioned as a way of saying farewell to folks. Can you give us some opening words about that and about that project and this song? Yeah, I am so lucky to have Sus. And we are on a really good label called Northern Spy. And we've got a double LP set coming out on vinyl on December 2nd. And it's just been a really a thrill to make records with these guys. Usually we do things very collaboratively, but this particular one came from something that I had done with the piano, I'm playing the piano over a synth bed. And then the other guys added their things on it later. Yeah. So a little more of a, a composition. So, so much of the, I mean, it's marketed as ambient Western. Brian Eno asks, you know, it's a very natural, the steel guitar is a very swoopy atmospheric instrument. And just listening through the albums of like, can I identify what is the pat contribution? I don't know, because it's just, you know, it's a chord played for a long time and then another thing comes you know it's just a very meditative you know it's not like a jazz thing where and now there's a solo doesn't seem like a lot of solos in this so much this band it's more just a riff but yeah something continuous like the ray beats slowed down and spread out you know and with different uh ethnic influences but like it seems like there's something comparable in the band ethic i, I well i guess uh, me Okay. Um, and it's instrumental. So, yeah. <laughs> well, I really enjoyed listening through those albums. I definitely would recommend those to folks. Thanks so much for doing this. Yeah, man. Thank you so much for having me.
Thanks so much to Pat. It's a little more difficult prepping for an interview with someone with such a non-linear career in that he didn't just have a band name and perform everything under that. I think Sus is a great place to start. I wasn't really sure in initially listening to those albums, like what he did, what the other people did. Doesn't really matter. It sounds nice. But then looking him up on SoundCloud, I was able to see, oh, here's all this soundtrack stuff. I really got a sense for his style. I want to highly recommend that Wide Open Sky album that he did with J. Walter Hawks in 2019 that is very readily available on all your streaming platforms. And it was only during the editing stages of this that I bothered to look on Bandcamp for him, and I saw that there are another six albums of his that I had not listened to, including five volumes of the new sounds from The Lost and Found that he talks about. So, patirwinmusic.com, susband.com, patirwin.bandcamp.com, and look him up on soundcloud.com. Because on Spotify, looking up his name, I only found a couple things. Most of the Ray Beats albums, I think I could only hear on YouTube. Ditto for his album with Eight-Eyed Spy. And for the Ray Beats with Philip Glass album, I only heard some of the tracks on that because he sent them to me. You may just have to actually buy the CD if you are very curious about what Philip Glass added to that combo. All right, welcome to 2023. I have been taking time off from interviewing. So right now I just have the one in the hopper with Claire Hamill. However, though I don't generally like to announce episodes that I have not yet recorded because something could always go wrong, I've been prepping for one with Jad Fair of the band Half Japanese for weeks. Half Japanese has many, many albums. He has many, many solo albums, many collaborations. He's a wacky guy. Very interesting style. So you might want to check out some of his music. I think the stuff by Half Japanese is a bit more accessible. Apparently Kurt Cobain was a big fan, if that's a selling point. So get plugged in to all of the new episodes as they come out at nakedlyexaminedmusic.com or look up Nakedly Examined Music on the streaming service of your choice. You may be listening to this on the Partially Examined Life feed, but I urge you to actually sign up for the Nakedly Examined Music feed if that is the case. And as always, I really would love your support. I know it's hard to give support even to the artists that I cover or to justify putting money into anything music related at this point because it's all on the internet for free. But if you want to be among the elect to show that you care about these interviews continuing to be made, go to patreon.com slash nakedly examined music. If you sign up that way, then you will not only get ad free versions of every episode, you'll get the occasional bit of bonus content. And consistently, for the last year or more, I've been posting my episode notes, which map out the songs that give the lyrics. Again, that's patreon.com slash nakedly examined music. Hope you're doing well. Until next time, keep on musicin'. This is Mark Linton Meyer signing off. 